Hi everyone. So usually I say focus on the notes, then go to the videos. For this particular video, which is um, very important when it comes to your first set of coursework and the coding element of your first set of coursework, focus on this video. It's difficult to explain coding without sort of taking you step by step through the algorithm. Of course you can read that, but I think it's useful being able to talk directly to you and try and talk you through this, this algorithm. At least last year, students found uh, this, t this particular video helpful. I'm completely revising it as compared to last year doing a, a new upload. And I hope actually I've clarified a couple of, of things that really needed clarification in the last video. Oh, sorry, I mean the video from last year. Right, so what we're going to do is solve the time independent Schrodinger equation. We're going to do it on a computer. We're not going to do it with pen and paper maths, we're actually going to do it on a computer. That means we're going to have to go from the idealized world of pure mathematics to the real world of discrete mathematics. The way I like to put it is in the real world we don't have d's, we have deltas. And it doesn't matter what accuracy we have, until we get to the delta function limit of infinitesimal or infinite precision, whichever way you want to look at it, which we can't, we have deltas. We have finite differences rather than finite differences in the limit that those differences go to zero. And that's what we code in a computer. I'm going to write, start off by writing the time independent Schrodinger equation, which is we've got a Hamiltonian acting on an eigenfunction, an energy eigenfunction, returns the energy eigenvalue associated with that eigenfunction and the eigenfunction itself. So what is that Hamiltonian? Well, that Hamiltonian is this. That's our Hamiltonian operator, which operates on a wave function, our eigenfunction, to give us back the same eigenfunction and the energy eigenvalue. Right, let's take this a little bit further. Let's get rid of this. That means what we have is minus h bar squared 2m d squared u dx squared. I'm going to just write it as u. So this is uh, general for any of the eigenfunctions. It's just going to get tedious carrying around this subscript. But what I'm writing here is true for any eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. d squared u plus v u is equal to e u. Let's do it, do it that way. So again, I've taken the n subscript of e with the understanding that if we're working for, for the first eigenfunction, this will be the first energy eigenvalue. If we're working for the second eigenfunction u2, this will be e2, the second energy eigenvalue, etc. It's just to stop, it's just so we don't have to carry around subscripts unnecessarily. So that's our, that's our time independent Schrodinger equation. And you know what the solutions look, at, look like. Let's consider the particle in an infinite potential well. You've seen this so many times. That's u1x. That's u two x, etc., etc., etc. You don't need me to go through them. You've seen them so many times before. So, the question then is, how do we translate this to a computer, and how do we solve it to get these expressions? We're going to start. Very good thing to do before you dive in to apply your. Um, computational method to an unknown situation is make damn sure that you apply that computational method to a solution that ha to a problem that has an analytical i.e. pen and paper mathematical solution then you can do a damn good test in terms of is my code reproducing what I'd expect from the, the analytical mathematics that's what we're going to do with the particle in a box particle in an infinite potential well this, um, this time and then we'll move on to particle in a finite potential well so, this is our core term, our second derivative. Remember, as I said, in the real world, certainly on a computer, there are no d's. 
there are discrete differences in that you measure, let's say you're measuring a function as a, you've got a microphone and you're measuring a signal, a waveform in time. And that waveform starts off at zero, and let's just write it as f of t. And it looks like that. Now, of course, you don't have a sample of this wave, wave function, waveform, whatever you want to call it, at every, every interval of time, or every instant of time, right down to the infinitesimal limit. What you have is a sample of that function. And let's say, and that will be determined by a sample rate. We have a finite sampling of our function or our waveform. I'm not going to do all of those. Where you've got a, a value, not particularly equally spaced, but let me put another one in here so it looks a bit better. Where you've got a value of the function acquired every delta t seconds. Not dt, because dt would be that in the infinitesimal limit. Or as delta t goes to zero, this is a finite difference. Let me just write that down. Finite difference. Similarly, if we now make this, instead of a function of t, if we make this a function of x, on a computer you're not going to have infinite precision. You're going to have measurements which are made with some delta x. And hence, we need to translate this to that type of language, that finite difference language. Okay, let's take our first eigenfunction, particle in an infinite potential well. As I said, let's just write it as ux. And you know what it looks like. Let me do this quite big. For reasons which will hopefully become clear. This represents L and this represents zero. On a computer, you don't have a continuous function. You have some sampling of that, which depends on your decision as to the number of points you've used to represent it, or somebody else's decision. Um, so let's do it like this. Let's say it's a really sparse sampling. Looks like that, which would not be a very good representation, where we've reduced our function down to just what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six points where we've got a separation delta x between those points. So let's call this point ux. Let's define this point as, as x in this particular case. That means over here we have ux minus delta x and over here we have ux plus delta x. Now if we wanted to calculate a derivative, what is a derivative? Well, it's the difference between these two values over our delta x, i.e. what we'd have is delta u delta x, which is a finite difference approximation to du dx. Now, at the moment, that would be an awful approximation. Why would it be an awful approximation? Because delta x is huge in terms of the overall spread of the function. So that would not give us a, a, a very good estimate. So what we want to do is make our delta x narrower. But for now, for point, for just in terms of illustration or illustrative purposes, and because I want to keep as much room as possible, we'll leave it like that. We'll leave it with quite a large delta x. But this is key. We've taken our derivative and we've turned it into a finite difference, which is all we can ever do on a computer. So that's our first derivative. How do we calculate our second derivative? Well, what is a second derivative? Well, it's basically the derivative of a derivative. And we've got a number of choices as to just how we do that in terms of uh, calculating what that derivative will be. I'm going to tell you about something which is called the centered difference approach for reasons which will become clear. There's, always the for there's also the forward difference, which involves looking forward, the backward difference approach, looking backward, calculating your derivatives and your second derivatives on that basis. Centered difference approach, for reasons I won't go into, is more stable and more accurate than either of those. 
What we're going to do is we're going to set up, so this is where we've sampled, these are where we have actual values on the computer for our wave function and down here as well. What we're going to do is, however, in terms of calculating what the formula for our centre difference is going to be, what we're going to do is effectively have some dummy points, and I'm going to use, instead of X's, I'm going to use little circles to represent those. Where this splits that interval in two. So this is delta X over two, and so of course is this. Similarly here, we're going to split this in two. That's delta X over two. And so too is that. Oh, for complete this, let's just put it in. All right, so you get the idea. It's going to get a little bit messy, but what we've done is we've subdivided our um, intervals from delta x to delta x over 2. Now, we don't actually have points here, but for reasons you're going to see as we work through the maths, that's not an issue. We're just using that almost as a placeholder, as a dummy value to allow us to calculate the, the center difference um, Algorithm the Selton difference formula. I'm going to get cluttered, so let me get rid of these. You know what they are, delta x over 2. Da, 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 da. And let's get rid of this. Remember that what we're doing here at this point is just calculating this, or getting a, a formula for how we calculate this on a computer. So, what we're going to have, uh, need more chalk. Can you see that? Yeah, good. Move it around a little bit. Um, it's going to be, well, du dx at, evaluated at um, x plus delta x over 2, that, minus du dx at x minus delta x over 2. Hope you can see that. So, what we're doing to calculate our second derivative is we are calculating the um, first derivative at this point, we're calculating the first derivative at this point, subtracting those so we've got the difference in the first derivative, and then dividing by delta x, which is the range of x over which we've calculated these derivatives. That gives us our second derivative. All we're doing is stepping back what you've done at A level. You went the other direction. You said, we'll start with finite differences and then we'll go to Ds. We're taking all that back, because there are no Ds in the real world, and bringing it back to deltas. That's all we're doing. So now our next step is, well, what's du dx at that point? Sorry, at that point, and what's du dx at that point? Let's work that through. Well, that will give us... So we want to calculate the derivative at this point, and we want to calculate the derivative, the first derivative, at that point and at that point. So what's our first derivative at that point? Our first derivative is going to be, well, the value of a function, we're going to use, we're going to base it on, on we're going to calculate our first derivative at this point on the basis of that point and that point, is going to be that minus u x over delta x. Remember this is all over delta x again from before. Minus well, what's this going to be? This is going to be ux minus ux minus delta x over delta x. So that's our first derivative at this point. That's our first derivative at that point. Our second derivative is going to be proportional to that minus that over delta x. If it's not making sense, please feel free to come along and ask me a question, either via email or at the end of one of the sessions, one of the in-person sessions, or come along and knock on my door. I mightn't always be in, but you're more than welcome to knock on my door. If here, I'll, I'll, I'll do my utmost to make time. Right, so we're nearly there. 
Hopefully now you've got the general idea. And notice, in this case, although we're using these dummy points, at nowhere have we actually incorporated those dummy points, i.e. the x, this would be x plus delta x over 2. We don't, have, we don't have those dummy points in here. We've just used them as placeholders to be able to calculate this formula. Is equal to, right, so let's put this, this is going to be ux plus delta x minus ux minus another ux and minus minus gives us plus ux plus delta x. All over delta x, but then all, we've got to take delta x squared because we've got another factor of delta x that we need to multi uh, sorry, divide through by. So this will be delta x, and I'll write it like that so there's no chance for any confusion, delta x squared. All I've done is rearrange this to get that, which in turn gives us uh, ux plus delta x minus 2ux plus ux, that should be minus delta x, my apologies, I hope some of you are screaming at the screen, why did it change from minus to plus? It changed from minus to plus because it was a mistake. Um, over delta x squared. Is that all on there? It is. It's a bit wobbly, but you get the general idea. Right, so that's our formula. Sorry, that should definitely not be an equals either. That should be an approximately equal to. And the smaller and smaller we make delta x, i.e. the more points you use to calculate uh, your wave function, calculate your eigenfunction, the better and a better approximation you're going to get to the analytical solution. Right, so let's now go turn back. We've got this. Let's now turn back to what we had for the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation was minus h bar squared over 2m d squared u dx squared and now we've got a finite difference version of that plus v u equals e u okay so we're going to make things even more straightforward now and we're going to take a judicious choice of units we are free to set the units as ever whatever way we like in physical problems, as long as we're consistent. You know, in principle, we could measure length by, I don't know, bananas as our basic unit. We'd have traceability and reproducibility issues, but you know, we could go back 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years and choose units like that. The physics remains the same, our units are just different. What matters is the dimensionality, is the dimensions. We obviously need expressions that are, um, correct in terms of the dimensions. But in terms of the units, we can choose the units whatever way we like. We'll be doing that a lot um, throughout the quantum world, uh, both semesters actually. Um, moreover, h bar is small. h bar squared, off the order 10 to the minus 68, really small. And m, 10 to the minus 31, okay, not as bad, but still pretty small. Carrying around numbers of that magnitude and um, in a computer program can have issues with regard to, well, computers can have a finite level of accuracy, as I've said. And if you're going down to the 68th decimal place, that can be an issue depending on the, the, the variable type you've used to store those variables. So, for all those reasons, what we're going to do is we're going to make, it, as I said, a judicious choice of units, and we're going to say h bar squared over m is not approximately, it's equal to 1. That's a choice, so we're working in units of h bar squared over m in this particular expression. Now, as long as we interpret the results that this calculation, this formula spits out, and remember that this is our choice of units, we're fine. Problems arise, of course, if we don't remember that we've used this particular choice of units, and then our units go astray. But, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna remember. Whether I remember or not, but no, we'll remember. Um, 
So we're going to use that, that as our choice of units, which means we can even simplify this further. That implies d squared u dx squared is equal to, h bar squared over m is 1, it's going to be equal to minus 2, let's take this across, e minus v u. So that's just, a, this is just a rearrangement of that with h bar squared over m set equal to 1. Now, we've got that, which is our Schrodinger equation in those wonderful new units, and we've got this, which is our finite difference approach, um, or finite difference formula to calculate the second derivative. So what we're going to do is put those two things together, and what the computer program is going to do, just as you saw, it's, why, it's actually why I set that piece of Python code right at the start on the first worksheet. If you haven't attempted that, or at least you haven't even attempted it or even looked at the solution, go back and do that because it's the same idea. The idea was to um, calculate the, the position and velocity of a ball when you drop it from a height. And what did we do? Well, we took our initial position, we took our initial velocity, we had a differential equation that described how those quantities changed, and we updated our, our position of velocity on the basis of that differential equation. On a computer, it's a finite difference equation. So we had v is equal to dx dt, you know that, but on a computer, that would be finite difference. Which means if we want to know how much, assuming we've got a constant velocity, if we want to know how much our x position has changed, then we tell the computer that your x position changed by v times delta t, whatever um, interval of time we've chosen in the code. Now this is more complicated, of course, but it's the, exactly the same idea. We're solving a differential equation, the Schrodinger equation. It's not first order, it's second order. But we're also, note that we're sticking to one variable at the moment, space, because it's the time-independent Schrodinger equation, i.e. time doesn't play a role. And we're going to um, use exactly the same strategy, which means we're going to predict the next position on the basis of the previous positions. This is second order, so we, not, we don't just need one um, previous position, we need two previous positions. So, let's um, couch that. First of all, d squared u dx squared we had was... Uh, uh, what was it? Minus 2e minus v u, and that would be ux current position uh, is equal to u x plus delta x minus 2 u x plus u x minus delta x over delta x squared, like that. So I'll just read that out. u x plus delta x, it's just this, minus 2 u x plus u x minus delta x over delta x squared. What we want is an equation that tells us what the next value of ux is going to be on the basis of the previous values. So what we're doing is we've got, I've got this point, what's the next point? Well, actually I've got this point and this point, what's the next point? I've got this point and this point, what's the next point? I've got this point and this point, what's the next point? So we're iterating through, we're incrementally going through the function, calculating the next point at each time. So that means the best way to write this in terms of our algorithm is ux plus delta x, we want that on one side, it's going to be, well, let's, that's ultimately what we want on one side. So let, let me go through this step by step instead of doing it all as a fair complete. So all of that, let's take this delta x squared, is equal to delta x squared by minus 2, and let's be careful with our minus signs, ev ux, and that's a square, let me put that there, right, so, and let's just put the, all of that in brackets, just so, um, yeah. yeah, minus x square, a lot of brackets there, but hopefully you get the idea, 
So all of that is equal to that. So that implies, let's take this all across, x plus delta x is equal to, take this across, 2ux plus u, sorry, minus, minus u, x minus delta x. Let's take that's this minus through, minus 2 e minus v ux delta x squared. Now we could reduce this even further. For example, you've got the common ux term here, and you could think about you know compressing this a little bit more, but Let's just leave it like that. That's all, that's as far as we need to go. So we've now got a formula, and therefore we've got the basis of an algorithm, whereby we can predict, predict the next value, x plus delta x of u, on the basis of the current value and the previous value, x minus delta x. Get rid of this, and let me draw that again so you can see exactly what's happening here. Bring up that graph right at the start. So we have this, and now we don't, we don't even need to worry about the dummy points, as it were. We've got u here. This is our analytical solution that we're trying to calculate. And what we have here is our value of ux. And here we have u x minus delta x, and here we have u x plus delta x. Of course, the computer knows nothing about x minus d delta x, x is and plus delta x is minus delta. It knows nothing about that. All the computer sees is a list of numbers, a vector of numbers, an array of numbers. That's all it sees. It has no clue as to what language were, what mathematical language we're imposing on top. So. This is a number, this is a number, this is a number. So when I say ux minus ux minus delta x, the, that basically means we have to tell the computer, take this number and subtract this number from it. Right? But that's our formula. This is basically or time independent Schrodinger equation, remembering that our units are h bar squared over m is equal to 1. So it's our time independent Schrodinger equation, the algorithm or the formula for that. Okay, so let's think about it. So it's good in terms of um, pr programming and coding. Think about what are our knowns and what are our, what are our knowns and what are our unknowns. So we'll say that we're going to kick off, which we have to, we have to kick off with guesses in terms of what's our current value and what's our previous value. So we're going to kick off with guesses. And we can, for the particle in a box, um, for the infinite potential well, good thing is we know our boundary conditions. So here, that point is zero. And what we can say is that our value of um, the next point is just slightly more than zero. That's a good starting guess. We can say it's just slightly more than zero. So we've got at one point which is at zero, and the next point is just slightly more than zero. So that means we can have good guesses. Um, and you might say, well, you've used the analytical solution to make those guesses. Indeed, I have. And that's often it's about making educated guesses on the basis of the physics, including the mathematical physics of the situation. So those are our initial conditions. So we've got those, we've got those. We know what the... Um, uh, the potential looks like. Remember, this potential is not just a constant. It depends on v. And if we're talking about the finite potential well, where we know what this height is going to be and it's no longer infinity, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, then we can feed in what the um, potential is going to be. We can have our starting values of u. We can have our two starting values of u. And we know what our potential looks like, V. Now the question is, what do we choose for E? What's the value of energy? The kinetic energy. How do we choose that? 
we guess. But we, we use a little bit of intuition to guess. What we're going to do, again, is our potential well. We guess an energy. We run our algorithm and we see what value of the um, uh, wave function, what value of ux we get um, it, for that energy. Now, if we choose it right, we're going to land the other side. If we choose that energy correctly, remember this is solving a differential equation. It's a very akin to a projectile problem. In that, let me show you. Right. Now I'm an absolutely lousy shot, so this is probably not going to go, but what we're doing is we're basically, the algorithm we're going to use is called the shooting method. And the reason it's called shooting method is because what we're doing is we're just choosing our value of energy. If we put that value of energy in and it's wrong, i.e. it doesn't give the right energy eigenvalue for that particular energy eigenfunction, we're going to overshoot. Or if it's the wrong energy, it could be too low, we're going to undershoot. If we get the right energy, and I am an absolutely atrocious at every single sport, and there is a finite and quite large probability that I will not get this in even from this distance, but let's see. If we choose the right energy, this happens. I swear I didn't do that deliberately. If we get the right energy, it should go in the bin, obviously. Um, you may want to scroll forward. I could be trying this for some time, but let's see. Let's see if we get it on the second attempt. <laughs> okay. Right. If we get the right energy, that happens. It goes in the bin. We get the right trajectory, so we meet our boundary condition on the other side. Right. So if we get our energy choice, if we choose our energy incorrectly, this type of thing can happen. Well, this is zero, this is L, so this represents our potential going off to infinity and similarly here, in terms of the potential. If we get it wrong, what can happen is, whoosh. So what our algorithm needs to do, what our shooting method algorithm to do is, choose E, does that make the function go to zero, or as close to zero as we want it to be, you know, is it between uh, 0 0.001, plus 0 0.001, and minus 0 0.001? Or do we want more accuracy? Is it between 0 0.001 and minus 0 0.001, or etc.? We need to have a checking condition whereby we check that this, um, our value of ux, is close to zero. As I say, as close as we want it to be. If we get it wrong, this type of thing will happen. It'll diverge or it'll maybe even possibly undershoot instead of overshooting, as in this case. And we keep varying, we stick it in a loop, set E, does our final value of ux end up um, at zero? If not, change E, do it again, change E, do it again, change E, do it again. Keep iterating until you reach the point where indeed it does this. You pick the right energy to get the projectile in the bin. You pick the right energy to get the function to curve in just the right way so that you get the eigenfunction you need. And of course, I'm talking about the first eigenfunction here, but this works for any of the eigenfunctions. So it's just a question of what we choose as our initial energy. How do we choose that initial energy? Well, I'll, I'll take you over to the computer and show you what actually happens when we choose the, the, the right energy. So let's take a look at when our shooting method algorithm gets it wrong. That's exactly what's on the screen at the moment. So you can see this is actually for the finite potential well rather than the infinite potential well. So we have a finite depth potential rather than an infinitely uh, deep potential. And you can see that the width of the well is, is one. And we take a choice, our initial choices of our wave function are close to zero for our values of our wave function are close to zero. And then what we do is we use that algorithm, we choose, we choose an energy, and then we calculate the next point um, for a wave function on the basis of the formula and basis of the finite difference formula. In this case, we've chosen Pearly in terms of energy. 
and it shoots off, it diverges right at the, at the edge. What we wanted to do is to come back down. We know it's got to come back down. The physics of the situation tells us it's got to come back down. It's not an infinite potential well, it's a finite potential well. Therefore, there is the chance for there to be probability density outside the well. Finite um, potential, therefore, there's a probability of tunneling. We'll see much, much more about tunneling later on in the, in the module. But you have covered tunneling, you have covered the finite potential well in from Newton to Einstein last year. So that's a bad choice. So the question then is, how do we make a good choice of energy? Well, again, we think about the physics of the, the situation. For the infinite potential well, the energy eigenvalues are given by n squared, h squared over 8ml squared. So let's choose the width of a well for simplicity to be unity to be 1. So then what we have is n squared, h squared over 8m. Remembering that our choice of unit is h bar squared over m, and make sure you can work this through, that means that our energy eigenvalues, our first energy eigenvalue, will be pi squared over 2. Make sure you can work that through. Remember, the unit here is h bar squared over m is equal to 1. So, in those units, our first energy eigenvalue is pi squared over 2. Pi squared is roughly 10, over 2 is roughly 5. So that gives us an upper limit for the energy. How do we know it's an upper limit? Because that's when we have the absolute most confinement we can have. When we go to a, because it's an infinite well. Once we go to a finite well of the same width, the energy will drop because there's um, a probability for the electron to tunnel. Therefore, it's not as tightly confined. Therefore, it's delta x is larger. It's delta p is smaller and overall its energy is smaller. Now you saw this last year in, um, from Newton to Einstein. We'll be covering it again. But that's what we'd expect. So basically five, roughly five, will be an upper limit. So we need to choose something lower than five as our initial guess for the energy. And similarly, it goes as an n squared. So if n uh, equal to one, e one gives us five, then the next energy eigenvalue should be around about 20 in those units. The next energy eigenvalue should be uh, 3 squared times 5, gives us 45. So we should always come in below those, use our initial guess for the energy to be below those values. And let's run the code. You can see it's iterating through, and it's already found the first energy eigenvalue, 3.41. Now it's going on to the second energy eigenvalue, it's found that. And now it's going to the third energy eigenvalue, E3, and it's found it. Which means it's calculated, given that we've set up the convergence criterion, the stopping criterion to be when the wave function goes to zero, when your calculated value of the wave function is close to zero on the other side of the well. And here we go. Does a really good job. So these are, this is the probability density rather than the wave function itself. But I just squared it up. It's a real function. So it's just basically the square of those functions. Note, it does a remarkably good job of calculating these, these wave functions. Um, moreover, you can see that the extent to which there's tunneling goes up the higher energy, the higher the energy of the state. And that's because states down here see a bigger effective barrier than states up here. So these, there's a pro less probability of tunneling because the effective barriers uh, higher, whereas here the barrier's a little bit lower, so you see more tunneling. I hope this video has made sense. In the coursework, you're given a step by step algorithm in terms of how to do this shooting method. Good luck with it. Last year, students did particularly well on this piece of coursework, Unexpected, unexpectedly well, I would say. Um, and um, I hope this year it's the same too. The very best of luck with it. I will stress this, however, because it's coursework and because you're marked on it, I cannot give you help with this before you hand it in. After you hand it in, if you want to come and have a chat and say, well, I just couldn't get this bit to work, how do you ever get this bit? That's absolutely fine, but not before you hand it in. Okay, good luck.